Hello and welcome to Calvary Church Online. My name's Brad. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church, and I'm so glad you're joining us today, especially if you're joining us for the first time. If that's you and this is your first time joining us, go ahead and click the welcome tab. Let us know who you are, and one of our team members will connect with you later on in the week, and we have a small gift to send you as a token of our appreciation. And I want to thank our entire Calvary Church family. It's because of your generosity that the ministry of Calvary remains strong here, at home, and abroad. So if you'd like to continue to partner with us, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen. And giving is safe and easy. All right, Calvary, it's time. Let's worship. Stand and worship with us this morning. the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. share 
a quick scripture with all of you from Hebrews 12, one and two. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God.
Hey, this is Vince. I'm so glad you're able to join us this Sunday. Uh, myself or my team is online, and we would love the chance to pray for you. So uh, if you would love or need that or it would be helpful to your life, go ahead and hit that live prayer button, and someone on my team will make sure to connect with you. Now let's give some hearts in the chat and throw some love to Pastor Steve. Calvary and welcome back to episode three of our summer story series as we place Jesus' time-tested parables under the microscope for a closer look. Jesus was a master storyteller. He was amazing and wherever he went people crowded around to hear what he was going to say next and his parables were these incredible stories that were cast alongside of the truth that in the moment he was trying to convey to the people. He engaged people where they were. As a matter of fact, Mark said, the common people heard him and were glad. That means they got it. They understood what he was trying to say, and they were, their imagination was engaged as he tied things together. And so time and time again, he, he would do this. He would tie something uh, spiritual to something physical. He would tie something that they couldn't see with something they could see. You see, his was a, an upside-down kingdom, one that many were still struggling to understand. Yet he was committed, committed to giving each of them a glimpse of what the kingdom really was so that they could seek it out in their lives. Now today we're looking at two similar stories, two short parables that Jesus communicated back to back, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, in a message that I'm calling treasure hunters. Now, back in the day, many years ago, when I was much younger, our student ministry used to go on retreats. Uh, and we would go to a place in eastern Canada called the Oak Island Inn. Now, Oak Island, for those of you that don't know, is a, a tree-covered island on the south shore of Nova Scotia that has intrigued treasure hunters for more than 200 years. It's believed that on that island, somewhere buried there, is hiding one of the greatest treasures of all times. But no one has been able to find it. People will get bits and pieces, and just when they think they're about to find the biggest treasure of all, the cave or the shaft that they're building collapses, or the tide comes in, or all these intricate things that seem like traps to prevent people from getting to them causes a roadblock, another one, time and time again. Now fast forward to today when two professional treasure hunters, both brothers, have bought the rights to most of the island and are convinced that they're the ones. They're the ones that are going to make the big find. They're bringing all new technology and ground scanning devices and all these different things. And so they have their own show, a reality show on the History Channel that maybe some of you have seen called The Curse of Oak Island, which I, I still get pulled into, if, to, if I was to be honest. Every now and then, I'll come across it, and it, you're always hoping for that one more episode where they're going to find something. But you know what? Even today, people are still fascinated by that search. Even you'll get people who geocache. I've been out on a few geocache hunts with Pastors Vince and Mark, and it's been incredible to, to kind of follow the clues to see where it will lead. But there's even more people that are engaged at a higher level. These are professional treasure hunters that have invested uh, great resources and much time as they are hoping and believing that, that this next find is going to be the big one. You know, after Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God being likened to tiny seeds, he now turns 
to two treasure hunters. Not on Oak Island, but in the book of Matthew. So let's read that scripture together. Found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Now, for the treasure hunter, it's the pursuit of the prize, that one thing, my precious, you know, they're going for the the ring. They got to find that one thing. But it fuels this anticipation and this hope that they're getting one step closer to finding it. A man named Eric Berlin, an author, once said that treasure hunts make much better stories when there's actually a treasure at the end. So true, right? You know, when our boys were quite young and we'd go on uh, vacation, family vacations together with my parents and my sister and her family, we would often rent a, a little cottage kind of close to the ocean with a nice beach. And every year, my wife Susan would put together this elaborate treasure hunt. And she would develop the map and one clue that led to the next clue so that once it was all completed, the kids could go after it. And it was just incredible memories that even to today we, we talk about. And so I would be the helper. You know, I'd help deploy the clues and hide them under rocks and make sure they didn't get washed away when the water came in. And then if, ultimately I would take the treasure that we had constructed and bury it in the sand somewhere, and then keep a lookout to make sure that a dog didn't dig it up or some other person walking on the beach didn't come across it. And then Susan would go back and give the map to the boys, and they would all head out on this treasure hunt. And it was so exciting because one clue would lead them to the next, and again, that anticipation would continue to build. And you know what? It wasn't the hopes that we were going to find a a treasure chest filled with gold. As a matter of fact, this treasure was more like a box that we had filled with maybe dollar store toys or sparklers or, or candy. Whatever it was, they were so excited to find it. But for us, the treasure was the time we spent together. It was the memories of, of all of us being together, laughing and having fun in the summer. Charles Spurgeon once said, Men know not the gold which lies in the mine of Christ Jesus, or surely they would dig in it night and day. They have not yet discovered the pearl of great price, or they would have sold their all to buy the field where it lies. You know, when Jesus tells the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the the pearl, He says something similar that is common for both of these treasure hunters. Both men sold all that they had to acquire this valuable thing. And both discovered something extremely valuable, a treasure that was found and desired and and purchased. Now, in order for us today to, to have the kingdom of heaven... We, you and I, must be willing to to give up everything that we have. The things that sometimes, over time, we place value on. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9 says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain and become one with him. Imagine that. Imagine selling everything that you have to gain that one thing. You sell your car, you put your house up for sale, you Craigslist all your clothes, and you give the rest away. What would be worth that kind of effort And sacrifice. And what would be the hardest thing in your life, if you think about it, to get rid of or to let go of? Jesus says his kingdom is worth giving up everything else for the infinite value of knowing him 
as Lord, having that relationship with a living God. It's like finding a hidden treasure or a, a pearl of great price. There's nothing in this world that compares to its value. And honestly, with so many things that have been shaken over the last two and a half years, I think we're left with a unique opportunity to reevaluate and maybe recenter where our values today truly rest. What are we not willing to get rid of? And what are we treasuring more than our relationship with him to gain more of, of Christ? What's blocking our path? Listen, whatever it is that you're clinging to today, when you finally let it go and lean into a, a, a deeper relationship with Christ, I guarantee you, you will never be disappointed because nothing in this world compares to him. And you know what? I think these parables sum up our lives in an incredibly brief but incredibly profound way. Life is kind of like a treasure, not a box of chocolate. It's kind of like a treasure, a treasure hunt in the sense that we're seeking something. We're always seeking more, something else that's going to add value. When we just get what we think we want, then we're looking for something else. And I don't mean that in a bad way because that pursuit brings hope. It brings a sense of bettering one's life, but I think no one wants to, to see a life filled with, with nothing. They, they want to see something substantial. And we all want to, to have value within our lives. We want our lives to mean something. And in a sense, we're all looking for treasure that will, will have value and add purpose to our lives. Without that purpose, we, we live aimlessly. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, Jesus continues to use parables as kind of a treasure map, leaving clues and revealing secrets about the kingdom of God. And both of these parables reveal important truths for us to consider in our lives today. And ultimately, these truths reveal what treasure actually is. The first thing that we see is the treasure is priceless. You see, in each of these parables, something is found that is worth more than literally everything the finder has. In both cases, they sold everything that they owned. The treasure he found, the pearl he found, it eclipsed the value of everything that that individual owned. It was priceless. What could be worth more than anything and everything in life? Well, we know as we read this and as Jesus communicates it, that's the kingdom of God. That's what he's trying to communicate. And the Bible tells us that the kingdom of God is very real. It's, it's an eternal kingdom. It's far above any earthly kingdom. Now, for a brief time back in the garden, this world system was temporarily hijacked by darkness when sin entered that time. But when Jesus came, so did the kingdom, invading the kingdom of darkness and its hold, right? Jesus showed up and his first message when he arrived was the kingdom of heaven is among you. And it was in the person of Jesus himself. He showed up in power to qualify you and I for eternity. Colossians chapter one, verses 12 to 14 says, and giving joyful thanks to the father, who has qualified or enabled us by Christ to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption. He purchased our freedom, right? And the forgiveness of sins. So when, when Jesus walked the earth, when he healed the paralytic, the lame, the blind, or the, the woman with the issue of blood, or raised that child from the dead, it was the kingdom of God invading the kingdom of darkness. When Jesus saved you, when he filled you, when he forgave you of your sins and gave you purpose, again, it was the kingdom of God invading the kingdom of darkness. 
Jesus Christ came to invade the kingdom of hell and, and to claim us as his own. It's why he came. It's why he died. It's why Jesus rose again. The only way that we can enter the kingdom of heaven is by believing in the king of heaven. The priceless treasure. Jesus himself, right? Who gave his life for you and I and for our forgiveness. He's the one who's the, the priceless treasure scripture is really pointing to. Who is worth more than anything. It's worth more than everything in this world. The second thing we see about the treasure is that it's discoverable. And every person discovers the kingdom in a different way. You know, if I were to take my mobile phone today and pair it with a Bluetooth device, I would need to make sure that it's discoverable, that I can actually find it and connect to it. Listen, we need to know that Jesus, the treasure, is discoverable. Now, to be honest, I don't think the treasure on Oak Island is discoverable, but it's not going to stop those guys from trying. I heard a story once of a couple in Northern California who went out early one morning to walk their dog. And as they were walking along, they looked over by a tree, and in the shade they saw what looked like kind of an old rusty tin can kind of sticking up out of the dirt. So they went over and they kind of dug it out and opened it up, and it was filled with gold coins. And so they dug a little bit more, and they found several of these tin cans filled with gold coins that dated back to the 1800s, and they were minted at about $27,000. That's how many coins there was. They figured it was probably a wealthy individual who didn't trust the bank, and he kind of buried it out in his yard. But those coins today are valued at $11 million. That's quite a, a dog walking day, right? So watch out for tin cans as you're walking the dog. <laughs> Can you imagine $11 million? You see, in the first parable that we talked about, the man stumbles onto the kingdom of God by accident. He's not looking for it. He's not really seeking it. And suddenly, there it is, kind of like our dog walkers in California. Now, in the Bible, this is people like the Apostle Paul, right? He's working hard at his day job, killing Christians. He's happy with his own religion. He wasn't looking for the kingdom, but he stumbles across the kingdom when Jesus knocked him off his horse. How about the Samaritan woman? She wasn't looking. She was just getting a, 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 a bucket of water from the well. When she stumbled onto the kingdom and met Jesus, who was just asking for a simple cup of water. Now, in the second parable, it's a little different. The man was actively seeking. He was hunting for treasure when he discovered it. How many pearls did this guy pass up before he eventually gathered everything, sold everything, and bought the one that was most valuable? Now, in Scripture, we see people that, that had this same pursuit, like blind Bartimaeus, who calls on Jesus, calls out his name to, to heal him. Or how about the Ethiopian, who was diligently seeking God's word, hunting and searching? He is discoverable. And it's God, ultimately, who draws us, whether it's putting us in the right place at the right time, or whether it's putting within us a desire to seek out the truth and to find it in our lives. And then finally, the third thing that we see is that the, the treasure is a gift that costs. Now that one sounds a little confusing. How can a gift cost if it's freely given? You see, in both parables, the finder sells all that they have to buy the field that contains the treasure or to buy this incredibly valuable pearl. But that could lead some people to think, when we read it today, that, that we need to purchase our way into the kingdom of God. Maybe we have to earn it by our good works. But the Bible is clear on this, very clear, that salvation is a gift of God, a free gift from God, and it's not something that we can buy or earn. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, it says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He gives it to you. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the real treasure, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if this treasure is a gift, why does it cost us everything? Well, I think it's 
maybe important to, and helpful to kind of look at this as two different decisions. You see, the kingdom of God calls us in the direction of love, but it costs us the direction of hate. It calls us in the direction of compassion, but it costs us the, the direction of indifference. It calls us in the direction of forgiveness, but it costs us the direction of bitterness. That's a good trade, in my opinion. It calls us in the direction of sacrifice, and it costs us the direction of selfishness. We see, dying to ourselves means dying to the world's direction as we seek the kingdom of God first in every way that we live our lives. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, you will show me the way of life. He's talking about that kingdom direction that he's drawing us to. Granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Today, let's ask the Holy Spirit to, to open our eyes to the, the priceless value of the kingdom treasure of knowing Jesus. And for those that walk with Christ, we need to, to understand the gravity and importance and the, 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 the great value of what the kingdom is all about, the great value of that relationship that we have and continue to invest in it. And for those of you that are watching today and hearing this message, Maybe in your life, you've been searching for truth. Maybe you've been needing answers and looking for life. Maybe you just stumbled upon this and, and clicked on this today and you didn't, didn't really realize what you were going to hear. But either way, know that God is drawing you with great purpose for your life. And he wants to give you new hope. He wants to forgive you of your sin and give you a life that he is always destined to. For you to have. If that's you today, I want to pray with you. So wherever you are right now, if you say, Pastor Steve, pray for me. I need to know Christ in that personal way. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am a, a sinner. I thank you for forgiving me of that sin. I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Help me to live a life that is full of hope, to take this treasure to recognize its value, and to tell everyone I can about it. Father, I also pray for those today that either have stumbled across the kingdom or sought it out but have found it, that maybe have grown weary, that, God, you would refresh them today and draw them close to you like never before and strengthen their walk with you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship God with your tithes and offerings. This is a chance for all of us to honor God with what he's given us. And as you give, it's because of the generosity of our entire Calvary family that our ministry remains strong and we're able to continue to partner with local missions, national organizations, and international missions, including supporting the Ukrainian Relief Fund. So if you would like to partner with us and donate today, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen, and giving is safe and easy. Before you go, I'd like to pray for you and your giving. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every giver and for every gift. And we pray that you would take the, the, the funds that come in and multiply them and use them to the furthering of your kingdom. We pray that we would see miracles done through uh, the, the building of your kingdom in both here at home and abroad, and that we would see lives changed. Lord God, we, we pray for the situation as it continues in the Ukraine, that you would bring peace and comfort to the people in that situation. We love you so much, and we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and we'll see you next week for Calvary Church Online.